Hello, gentlemen, and welcome to section 6.3, Chemical Names and Formulas. A lot of this is review, but there are some new things toward the, towards the end, so please take um, adequate notes. When we're naming different compounds, we have different methods. The first one we'll talk about naming ionic compounds. First off, ionic compounds are made of ions, cations, and anions. Cations are positively charged atoms, anions are negatively charged atoms. Review your notes on ions to so know more about that. Cations are usually metals, and anions are usually nonmetals. Now, an example, magnesium and chlorine bond together. We know magnesium is Mg. It's found in group number two. It has two valence electrons. It's going to lose those two valence electrons as in a metal and become a cation, Mg2+. It's Mg2+, because it has two fewer electrons than it does protons. Protons win by two. Chlorine is in group 17A or 7A, and it has seven valence electrons. Elemental symbol Cl is going to be Cl1 minus because it's going to gain one electron to achieve an octet. Magnesium lost two electrons to achieve an octet. Do the crossover method, and we get, I'll draw it over here, MgCl2. So one goes to the Mg, two goes to Cl. That should be reviewed. When well, we name this, we name it. The first name of my cation, which is magnesium, just its name. And then we add to it the name of my second atom with an IDE ending. So chlorine goes to chloride, magnesium chloride. That's how we would name that. That's an ionic compound. We also know that we have polyatomic ions as well that can form ionic compounds. So my polyatomic ions, examples would be hydroxide, OH minus, Sulfate, SO4, 2 minus, carbonate, CO3, 2 minus, and ammonium, which is NH4 plus. These are our polyatomic ions. They're also made of cations and anions. Polyatomic ions are essentially covalently bonded atoms that have a charge. Now, how does it look when it's <clears throat> um, being named or the formula is being drawn for it? Very similar to ionic compounds with monatomic ions. So magnesium, it's still Mg2+. Hydroxide, we look at our polyatomic ion chart, we find hydroxide, and we write it just as is, OH-. And we use the crossover method here. I'll write the compound here. Magnesium gets the 1. Hydroxide gets 2. So it takes two hydroxide polyatomic ions to satisfy that one magnesium. This creates an electrically neutral compound. And we name this name and name. So we take the name of one, magnesium, and we add to it the name of the other one, hydroxide. This is with polyatomic ions, magnesium hydroxide. When ions are dissolved in a solvent, they form electrolytes when they're in solution. Remember that. Now, if we don't have ionic compounds, we've talked about molecular compounds. A molecular compound, when you have two or more atoms bonded together by sharing electrons. We haven't talked much about molecular compounds with that terminology. This terminology is very similar to what we've been talking about with compounds. Compounds are just two or more different atoms bonded, but with molecular compounds, it's specific, meaning it's when they are bonded through sharing electrons, or meaning they're covalently bonded. So atoms that are covalently bonded are molecular compounds. Ionic compounds would not be considered molecular compounds. Okay, when <clears throat> we have a molecular compounds usually from a nonmetal bonding with another nonmetal. Some examples would be carbon dioxide, CO2, H2O, C2H6O. These are my chemical formulas. When naming these formulas, we use prefixes and a suffix as an IDE ending. So we name using prefixes. The prefixes are mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, deca. These are in numerical order from 1 being mono to 10 being deca. After we add our prefixes to the second element, we add an IDE ending. Let's go through that now. So for CO2... If my first element only has one atom, if there's only one atom in my first element, I don't write mono. I simply write 
the elemental name. In this case, carbon. I have two oxygens, so I put di for two, and I change the ending to IDE, carbon dioxide. H2O. I have two hydrogens, so I write di for two, and I keep the name the same, dihydrogen, and O. I have one O, so I write mono, and I change the ending of oxygen to IDE, so monoxide. This is all review. Now this element here, I can't name it using this system. You can only use this system when you're naming binary compounds. Binary compounds means that I only have two atoms, or sorry, two different elements existing in my compound. Here I have three. I can't name it using this system. Thus, we use a different system for that, which we haven't learned yet. Now, molecular compounds do not form electrolyte solutions. They do not dissolve in water to form compounds that can conduct electricity. They're not ions. There are no ions in this molecular compound solution, thus no electrolytes. Now, one concept that we talked about in our investigate is oxidation numbers. So oxidation, an oxidation number essentially is a number assigned to an element in a compound designating the number of electrons the element has lost, gained, or shared in forming that particular compound. We'll talk about why shared is underlined momentarily. Now, let's do some examples of this. That's the best way to do it is just with the examples. Oxygen, element O. When it goes to achieve an octet, it's going to gain two electrons. It has six balanced electrons. It's going to gain two to achieve an octet. When it does so, it becomes O2 minus. Its oxidation number, we would say, is 2 minus, or minus 2. So its oxidation number is 2 minus. Now, how does this apply with compounds? Let's see. My example down here, calcium oxide. I know that calcium, when it forms an octet, will <clears throat> give away two, val two valence electrons and form Ca2+. Oxygen, up, just up, like up here, it's going to form O2- because it gains two valence electrons. So 2 plus and 2 minus are oxidation numbers. Notice when these two oxidation numbers add to each other, they cancel each other out. That's why we have no subscripts here. And this is how many electrons that were lost or gained. Now, this is an ionic compound. This is just a single atom in an ionic compound. Let's see what it looks like in an imaginary compound here. Sorry, not an imaginary compound, in a molecular compound. Excuse me. Carbon dioxide is in a, a molecular compound. And we call its oxidation numbers imaginary because it didn't really lose electrons or gain electrons. It's sharing. That's why sharing here is underlined. So sharing kind of alludes to imaginary oxidation numbers. So let's think about it in this way. Oxygen. Oxygen, when it achieves an octet, is going to gain two electrons. When it gains two electrons, it's going to become O2 minus. In this compound here, I have two oxygens. So I'm going to have two minus, oxidation of two minus, but I'm going to have two atoms. So two of these two minus charges giving me, say, four minus. Now I know that this compound is electrically neutral. There's no charge. When I breathe out carbon dioxide, I can't conduct electricity. So I have a very neutral compound that's produced. So carbon has to balance out that 4 minus charge. Thus, carbon's oxidation number has to be 4 plus. The 4 plus and the 4 minus are the oxidation states, we call them, for carbon and oxygen. And when they add together, they make a neutral compound of zero charge. That's oxidation numbers. Now, we find this <clears throat> most readily, and it becomes very helpful when we talk about 
naming transition metals. We name transition metals that are bonded in ionic compounds with a system called the stock system naming method. This is where we use Roman numerals to represent the oxidation states of various metals. Now, if we remember, our transition metals are here in the middle, in our D block, if we're talking about orbitals. Now, if we remember, we also were able to figure out the oxidation states of other metals by using the group number. So elements in group 1A had an oxidation state of 1+. plus. Group 2A, 2 plus. Group 3A, 3 plus. So those metals found in those groups, you could easily identify them based on the number of valence electrons and the group number. With transition metals, it's not so easy. When you think about what charge do they form, we don't really know. It's a question. They're called transition metals because they can transition between different oxidation states. Sometimes they may be 1 plus, sometimes they might be 2 plus, sometimes they're 3 plus, sometimes they're 5 plus. It depends on the situation. So we use Roman numerals in the chemical names of these compounds to represent what oxidation state they're actually in. So here's an example. Iron 2, well, sorry, Fe2O3. What's the name of that? Well, first thing we have to do is figure out the charges of these. We know the crossover method is used to get ionic compounds into their you know, formula state. Let's uncross this to see exactly where this came from. This 3 goes back to the Fe, so we get Fe3+. plus. We know it's 3+, plus because our cation always comes first, and metals always form cations. This oxygen gets O2-. minus. We know oxygen is O2-, minus. oxygen is in group 6A, it's going to gain two balanced electrons and always be O2-. minus. So this 3+, plus is the oxidation number or oxidation state of iron. Ox iron has an oxidation state of 3 plus. Oxygen has an oxidation state of 2 minus. When I write the chemical name of this, this is going to be called, I write the first name, just as I wouldn't all, all ionic compounds, iron 3. I put my 3 in parentheses and in Roman numerals to represent the oxidation state of this particular iron. So iron 3 oxide, also known as rust. And we only put Roman numerals in the name. We never put it in the formula. Never ever will you put a Roman numeral up here as a charge or as a subscript. It only goes in the name. And if I have a name, like nickel 2 bromide, I can deduce what the oxidation state of nickel is from my Roman numeral. I know Nicholas is in I. 2 stands for its oxidation state, or its charge. Nickel 2 plus. It's going to be positive again because metals form cations. Bromide, we know bromine is Br. It's in group 7A. It's going to gain one valence electron and become Br minus. So I do my crossover method. I get NiBr2. That would be nickel 2 bromide. And you would say it that way, nickel 2 bromide. Not nickel bromide, but nickel 2 bromide. There are some exceptions to the rule. There are some elements that always have the same charge, no matter what. They don't transition. One is silver. Silver is always 1 plus. Zinc is always 2 plus. Cadmium is always 2 plus. Silver is here. Zinc, cadmium. One way to remember this is we know that Aluminum is here. Aluminum always has a charge of 3 plus. If you just go down the staircase this way, it's aluminum 3 plus, zinc 2 plus, cadmium right under zinc is 2 plus, and silver is 1 plus. So it's kind of like 3, 2, 1. It's a good way to remember it. We also use the stock system naming method with elements in group 4A at the bottom. Metals here in group 4A, you know, they're in my other metals category down here at the bottom. Namely, SN, which is 10 and PB, which is lead. So gentlemen, hopefully this helps. We're gonna be doing some practice with this shortly, and this is gonna help you step your game up when coming, when naming different compounds in chemistry. Take good notes, gents.